this committee. Um, so thank you for volunteering upon and by the National Assembly, and of course the chair of the Parliamentary Service Commission happens to be the Speaker of the National Assembly. Um, so what would be your view? I once visited Nigeria to see a friend who was a Speaker of the Senate because um, <clears throat> they invited me to the National Prayer Breakfast, the first edition of the same in Nigeria. His name was David. Um, and he was, because the Speaker of the Senate, he was a chair of the bicameral legislature. Uh, David Mack was his name. And uh, I find that personally, because of what you say, the oversight role of the Senate, even in our country, seems to be more defined as presently constituted than, forgive me, majority leader and minority leader, the National Assembly, than it is in the case of the National Assembly. What would be your view? Wouldn't we probably just <clears throat> be candid about this? As you've been candid about the funds, you don't like them, and <laughs> And, and it is very, very clear. That's my number one comment. The next one is, um, it has to do with uh, rights. I'm sure uh, you, you are a preeminent uh, lawyer, human rights, uh, I'm sure is also within your province, constitutional law <clears throat> notwithstanding. Um, if you give a people a constituency, and then they hear that this committee, in his wisdom, or lack of it, <laughs> has come up with recommendations to do away with 190 constituencies. Wouldn't you think that is disenfranchising our people? Um, and the more practical thing is, in fact, uh, when the boundaries delimitation team is in place, we'll be hearing them. You'll be hearing people saying, we want, because the closer the administration is, the closer the member of parliament is to the people, um, the MCA, the better it is. <clears throat> because the, the maximum, you know, there can be no taxation without uh, representation. And this issue of taxation, I don't know whether you, you really dealt with it, uh, the high cost of living, um, Eugene, I'm sure if he gets a time, he'll be able to address you <laughs> extensively on that. Uh, because you say the role of the MP is to tax and then to uh, collect revenue, tax and then oversight. This, this, this is a, the ideal situation. So, on those two points, I, I really would want to gain your wisdom. And as I said, it's so good to see you again. I was Vice President when you were Attorney General. And clearly, this country owes you plenty. I thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Kocha, uh, AG, we will ask you to be noting the question. We take a round, then you will answer. Maybe I'll go second round before I give the Honorable Pio and I, as a normal, then uh, Honorable Eugene Omalo. And Wambilianga will close for us if Mugen will not have any. Uh, you spoke on the question of the constitution of IBC. And you did indicate that the IPPG model was uh, what you described as an uh, unmitigated disaster for the country. And you seem to prefer the professional mode of uh, appointment of IPPG. I just want clarification whether that would be what has been proposed by uh, one of the professionalizations as um, going for a professional sort of uh, human resource consultant to recruit the commissioners, or the current uh, model that we have where you have a panel that uh, then look, goes to look out for professionals through a competitive process. I want to hear your view on that. What <coughs> your view would be that professional model to use? Then, uh, in reconstituting that I, IEBC, from your experience as AG, 
uh, because you were, you say you were involved in the reconstruction of IBC. And I believe the time you were AG, it was a panel model that was used, as it still is uh, in the laws today. Do you think that panel system as it is today sufficiently covers all stakeholders or are there stakeholders that you feel we would be able to incorporate uh, in that panel system? Okay. Uh, thank you very much and I'll be very quick. Uh, uh, AG, just on the same issue of the IPPG, in fact I was rather surprised when you described the IPPG as unmitigated disaster. Unmitigated disaster, just to use your words. And yet we know for sure that every time we have reconstituted the IBC, or electoral body for that matter, it has been in response to a political situation. If you agree with me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then how this IPPG, from my recollection, was meant to address a political situation then, in 1997. Remember, it came at the backdrop of the clamor for reforms. And the mantra then was, no reforms, no elections. <coughs> and it's also documented that this, I, this the, I, the electoral commission that was born out of the IPPG supervised the 1997 elections. Okay. But it went ahead to supervise the 202 elections that has been billed as one of the best elections in this country. So then, and in fact, what happened thereafter is what perhaps would have led to a disaster, if I'm not wrong. Because in, a, in, a, in a, I think, 205, or thereabout, the then president, when at the expiry of the time of the Electoral Commission then, the IPPG Electoral Commission, you naturally appointed commissioners to the commission against the wishes of the opposition, very strong wishes of the opposition. And the rest, as they say, is history. What followed then, you know. Then, what then would motivate you to describe IPPG wholesome as a disaster? Just let me understand. Yet, from where I sit, I thought it was one of the best uh, approaches <coughs> to dealing with the issue of inclusivity and consent of building. Two, you say you don't agree at all with the matter of revisiting the presidential elections of 2022, but it won't be helpful to be futile, to paraphrase you, to paraphrase you. But what do you make? of the clear provision of Article 88, Sub-Article 4H of the Constitution, which requires, let me just read, I don't perhaps, which requires uh, the IBC to facilitate the observation, monitoring, and evaluation of elections. Elections, all types of elections, the presidential, parliamentary, ward, and so on so forth. From where we sit, we know the IBC has been able to facilitate the observation and monitoring of the 2022 elections. In so far as the evaluation of those elections is concerned, nothing of the sort has been done. Would you be opposed to the evaluation of the elections as contemplated in Article 88 4H. Last, you say you have got no problem with the creation of the Office of the Leader of Opposition. And you seem to suggest that the, 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 the officer could sit in Parliament. But you don't clarify further whether you want this office created within the framework of a parliamentary system parliamentary or presidential system or some sort of hybrid system. Thank you. Okay, Omar. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my recollection is uh, that probably the 1997 elections 
was the far, by far one of the most violent. Uh, and they were actually mitigated by the IPPG uh, uh, Electoral Commission. Number two, I, I think there should be no, we, might, we are not revisiting the Supreme Court uh, decision that is settled. I do not think we want to create an impression, at least from our side, that we are in any way reopening the Supreme Court verdict or process. We are though open to listening to whether there is a process of auditing the processes so that we continue to improve on the systems and electoral management, but not to revisit in any way uh, the decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, but my qu actual fundamental question to you <coughs> is on the issue of the ECOSOC rights, economic, social, cultural rights that you articulated yourself to. You know, there is, there is a, there is a, our constitution talks in many regards about social justice. And there's a very radical understanding of what social justice is, is to make those who are worse off better off before those who are better off become well off. So there are those who are better off who are earning taxes or who are earning salaries, and you're asking them to support housing projects for the vulnerable. You're asking them to pay 2.75% to fund affordable and accessible health care under the UHC program. That is part of the dictus of the Constitution, that these programs cannot wait under the classical capitalism that we first, all of us, make wealth before we start to disperse wealth. It must go concurrently. As we are making wealth, we must disperse wealth and we must disperse part of these advantages that come uh, with, uh, to, to protect or to cushion the people at the lowest prism of our society. That's why if you see part of the taxations that is being proposed, it is largely to fund economic and social rights, housing, health care, and, and the such and the such. So that those who have a little more are told to make a small sacrifice so that those who have nothing are put to a level that they are better off before all of us can become well off. It's, the, it's, it's actually the constitutional mechanics. So I, 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 I wanted to slightly, uh, you to speak to it, whether this social democracy or democratic socialism, as it is called, isn't a small sacrifice so that those who have nothing are put to a level that they are better off before all of us can become well off. It's, the, it's, it's actually the constitutional mechanics. So I, 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 I wanted to slightly, uh, you to speak to it, whether this social democracy or democratic socialism, as it is called, isn't about expanding the tax for those who have more, and, and for possibly helping those who have less. This outcry, when you are setting up universal health care, when you are setting up housing programs, were, out, were outcries that we even saw in the United States when Obamacare was trying to, uh, you know, for find a footing or other social programs were trying to find a footing. The, the last one. You talked, uh, up here you were told you are a government in waiting. The only problem of the opposition is they don't want to wait. <laughs> so, but uh, I do agree that uh, Imani Shungwa, as leader of minority, uh, or majority, ha can have a relationship where, in matters of national security, there can be a certain nexus of briefing between uh, 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 the, two, the, the, the two parties, so that time and again, people are appraised with matters of state. The, the one or two of your radical opinions, but because I'm also in that space of politics, are very popular with me internally. <laughs> but I cannot express open support for it. I just do believe that there should be clear separations of power. But if this committee should so decide to as constitutional as the funds, I shall support that position. I think, Hassan, you have to be bold, as bold as you can be in some of these things. We'll hear now Honorable Eugene. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I think on the issues of electoral justice, uh, there has been an issue about the last uh, general election. And there are those who have described it as uh, one of the best 
elections or uh, one of the most credible elections. But for some of us, uh, we believe this was one of the most incredible elections. Uh, we had never uh, uh, seen a situation. I think Hassan should put over his microphone. We had never seen a situation <laughs> where the electoral body is split. It's like a, a split jury or a, almost a hung jury. But in this case, the majority of the commissioners disowned the results. The chairman, with the minority, only two, upheld the results. And the country found itself in a political and a legal uh, terra incognita. It's a, an unprecedented situation. That's why I'm saying uh, it, it was not normal. There were not normal elections. And we were particularly looking at the provisions of um, Article 138, uh, uh, 3C. And uh, the Supreme Court pronounced itself on it by saying the decision of the commission, IEBC, should be a corporate decision in terms of the results, telling, verifying. It should be a corporate. It cannot be the decision of the chair. Uh, and when you come to, uh, of course, Article 138.10, uh, the, the, the chair uh, uh, is the one who declares. But, but in a situation where we have a rogue chair, this time we have the chair and only two commissioners. But we can find ourselves in a situation in future where the chair disagrees with the commission and the chair by himself declares results that probably the rest of the commission does not agree with. The Supreme Court was very clear in uh, interpreting uh, that particular article that we find, and I quote the, 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 this ruling, we find that the chairperson cannot arrogate himself the power to verify and tally the results of a presidential election to the exclusion of the other members of the commission. Indeed, Article 138.10 of the Constitution, although the power to declare the results of a presidential election after verification and tallying is vested in the chairperson, he does not, or he does so only as a delegate of the commission, with the corporate decision of the commission. Going into the future, we would like uh, to get your opinion on that in terms of advice in putting the country on a more uh, uh, on a, a more uh, political and legal terra farmer in terms of uh, such situations arising in future what would you uh, advise uh, on that on the issue of the cost of living as his excellency Kalonzo has said uh, these socioeconomic rights under Article 43 also include the rights under Article 201 on uh, the finance, uh, the taxation, and the equitable taxation of the citizens, and equitable sh sharing of the tax burden. In the current situation today in this country, there are many Kenyans who cannot put food on the table because of the high cost of living, and particularly the Finance Act 2023 that uh, saw everything going up, particularly the cost of fuel. On fuel alone, we have almost uh, 16 or so uh, you know, levies and taxes that have really increased fuel to unprecedented levels. And we're not talking of just uh, the, the uh, Mamambogas in the village who have to pay over 33 shillings more for kerosene out there in the village. Life is becoming unbearable. Even our journalists here and the professionals, anyone with a pay slip today is uh, really an endangered species because of the many taxes. What would you advise? There have been proposals here, and uh, we wanted to hear from you uh, because it is a policy decision and enjoyment of those uh, socioeconomic rights under Article 43. It's not a favor from the government. Under Article 21, it is the fundamental duty of the state 
to ensure enjoyment of those rights by the citizen. In terms of policy measures, so if there are uh, wrong policies that have been put in place that have overburdened the citizen, what would you advise in terms of uh, probably reduction of some of the taxes or reviewing of some of those levies on fuel, on, uh, on electricity? We really would like to hear from you so that we can, as a committee, make appropriate recommendations. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, Catherine was to go first. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you, Pro Professor, for your presentations. I am one of those who is actually going to agree with you on most of your popular presentations. These are very unpopular amongst politicians, but to some of us, they're very popular. I first want to associate myself with your comment on the 2022 elections and uh, the presidential results. Actually, for the first time, compared to 1997, 2013, 2017, the 2022 was less problematic. This is just the simple reason. On the ballot and on the final day, actually, Uru was whitewashed at the ballot so badly that he quickly conceded. And next, we also look at one other very unpopular uh, point, and this is a very great idea, where on very fair basis, let us abolish the seat of women rep and create two seats in every constituency. The only biggest undoing with that point is the reduction of the constituencies. Is there a way, senior professor, which you can modify that point <coughs> in such a manner that instead of reducing, let us look at a way and get us a way, give us a formula. I know with your wisdom you can, of which we can have these two seats, one man and one woman introduced in every constituency. And popular as it is, that is the best point that I've had in the better day of today. And clearly, it is clear you have said empowering a woman is like empowering the whole society. So I'm sure if the two-thirds gender rule was to take off, that is the best solution. And I even beg that this committee adopts that kind of a policy. Thank you. Akala. Uh, thank you. Chairman, first, uh, you know, having listened to Prof, I'm one of those proud Kenyans who were taught by a professor. He welcomed me to University of Nairobi as a first-year student. The only thing that he was shocked about my person is when I told him the school I'd come from. He wondered whether I never knew that there was a, a school called Alliance and why I never went to Alliance. But, not, uh, not uh, correction, Senator. Not a school. The, Whether the, they are the, the school, the school yes. called Alliance. <laughs> yes, but uh, happy to see you, Prof. And uh, we are really going to benefit, you know, from your presentation. I, I hope there will be some written memo that you leave uh, behind that will will assist us. Now we we are where we are because. We are a country on crossroads. We, we are trying to find a solution to some of the problems we are facing. Um, just like uh, the people who, who wrote the American Constitution in 1787 were trying to address the concerns of the 17 states that were trying to secede. And we need to get solutions that can fit into our own unique local circumstances. Now, on the issue of IEBC, you, have, you know we have had two scenarios. IBC commissioners picked through the IPPG model, and the one of 207 picked through uh, a, a very professional uh, process where meritocracy was the guiding uh, really thing and technical knowledge. But if you read paragraph 55 of 
the Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court judges said all this, in our view, points to a serious malaise in the governance of an institution entrusted one of the monumental tasks of midwiving our democracy, an institution that obviously needs far-reaching reforms. That was the Supreme Court, and you have said you agree with the Supreme Court. Prof, I would want you to give a comment on uh, whether you deem it to be a success story, the Electoral Commission of Mozambique that is uh, picked through Parliament on the strength of political party representation with an input of civil society, after which they take oath of office to discharge their functions in a fairly professional uh, uh, manner. Would you, uh, Prof, really have an objection to solve our problems? We also adopt a system that accommodates all the political uh, heavyweights so that we have a confidence building process in the management of an election. And then we can have the technical staff in uh, our constituencies, our counties, dealing with issues of uh, running and managing an election. I like your comment, taking Mozambique as one of the success stories where political parties pick the electoral commissioners. That's one. Number two, on uh, the principle in the Constitution that uh, an election should be very viable, is there any problem if there was to be an audit of the servers just to confirm the results that were announced by IEBC as a way of complying with the Constitution. And then the final question on that paragraph that I've read, 55 of the Supreme Court decision, would you support a reform of IEBC that includes the vetting of staff of the commission in view of that finding of the Supreme Court. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Prof. You can take those ones. Uh, thank you very much for all of you, like your kind remarks, especially His Excellency Dr. Kalonzo Masioka, who has said very kind things about uh, my tenure as the attorney. Those views may not be widely shared, but I treasure <coughs> that compliment. <clears throat> now, you asked me, sir, whether we should rethink the bicameral uh, arrangement that is in this country. The truth, again, is the draft that we, we drew here in Bomas had the Senate as the upper house <laughs> and, the, house and, 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 and uh, the National Assembly as the lower house. So we, the technicians, thought that that's how a bicameral uh, legislature should work. It is the politicians who reversed the order. And in fact, it was very interesting because uh, I remember people like uh, my late friend and, and colleague, the Honorable Mutula Kilonzo, uh, who was among those who were opposed to, to the arrangement in Bomas, uh, uh, the Honorable Kembe Gitora, another friend of mine, they were opposed to And later, they went to the Senate and found that there wasn't the work that they had <laughs> gone there to do. And, and, and they wanted us to find a way, now I was in government with them, of finding work for the Senate that was equal to the status of the Senate. So this is an issue that we can, uh, depending on how widely we want to open the reform process, it is an issue that can usefully be revisited. I personally always conceived of the Senate as the house where our more senior politicians, more experienced, much more, uh, you know, uh, 
diplomatic uh, the uh, politicians would be sitting as a house of elders and and uh, and so on uh, in fact in some countries this upper chamber is not wholly elected so because, so that it allows for example the, uh, this is a very self-serving example so uh, say a uh, 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 a professor who has now retired from public service to sit there and 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 comment on bills and, and so on. Uh, so I, I I agree that uh, it is an issue that uh, we we can uh, uh, look into. Uh, you asked me about if we were to reduce constituencies, are we not are we not disenfranchising people? They were used to being called uh, uh, Kiambu constituency, uh, Kajiado constituency, and now it covers a whole area. I think as long as the resources are available for distribution, uh, I don't think that uh, people would necessarily be seriously concerned. Uh, I come from... Uh, uh, a constituency, not f where we are now, uh, and um, I am not very sure where it reaches to the north. I don't know how far it reaches to the south. I do know that I am here. I have a member of parliament, and uh, I'm happy. Uh, if tomorrow I was told uh, uh, Ngong, Ngong, uh, Westlands has been added to your constituency. Uh, I, I I am not sure I relate specifically to to the laws. Uh, if <laughs> if there is a efficiency, I think we want uh, members of parliament to be capacitated. It's the resource question. If the MP has the resources to look after the the, the I don't think Wanainchi worries so much whether they they, they you know. They are next to each other or further away from each other. This cost of living uh, issue, uh, uh, yeah, Your Excellency, this is uh, uh, we 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 keep going round uh, 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 with it because essentially it's a resource issue. I think I personally have come to accept the fact that the government has no money of its own. The government has no money of its own. The government has only money raised through taxation, uh, through borrowing, and through gifts. And we, 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 have, <laughs> we have a very complicated problem where I hear the public say, and it's a very important argument, stop taxing. Stop taxing. Kenyans usually also use the word stop over taxing. Then they say stop borrowing. <laughs> so stop borrowing and stop taxing. And increase spending. Now that is an impossibility. I'm not an economist, but uh, I, I am a man from uh, the University of Life, and I know that in the University of Life, if you don't tax and you do not borrow and you have not been gifted by somebody, then you don't have it. So we, we must cut our cloth to feed, uh, to feed our resources. Uh, I don't believe that we can, uh, we can tax ourselves out uh, uh, into progress. Uh, but I do think that the only thing that I, you can be certain as a human being is death and taxes. Those, they have to be. Now, without making light of that very important question, I think that there are tax policies, and I hear everybody around this room who is saying that tax policies must be stable. If they are not stable, an investor, and I, I personally worry a lot about local investors, not foreign investors. The local investor is not able to invest within a tax regime 
that is that changes too much, that is not stable. And, and, and therefore, I agree with all those who have said that that is something we ought to look into. Um, Chairman Shungwa asked me about IPPG. And I, I, I think uh, Honorable Andati as well. The truth is this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and we must uh, uh, talk truth to each other because this is our country. This IPPG model is a horse trading model. It is a horse trading model. And I challenge you when you retire later in the day, when you do your research, the IPPG IEBC contained individuals who were directly connected with the appointment. I can tell you there was a, there were at least uh, two lawyers who were who were lawyers to the appointing party. So it's not as transparent as it would appear. And uh, although it delivered one good election, uh, we also knew that it had its own internal. So what do I think about it? I think that the model that works is a professionalized model. Is the one we have now professionalized sufficiently, but not fully? And that's where we need to fix. We need to fully professionalize. And this now brings me uh, to, to the question by uh, Honorable Andati. I agree entirely that part of the crisis uh, that um, uh, arose out of the unilateral appointments that came post IPPG. Because those unilateral appointments created the political impression that there was no commitment to fairness. And I agree that that was not the right thing to do. And maybe had that not been done, Probably the crisis that we had in 2007, 2008 could have been avoided. But uh, that's, we have the hindsight of history. Um, I agree with those who say the election is over, the Supreme Court has pronounced itself on it. We are not. We are not looking to audit it for accuracy. We are. We are looking to audit process for improvement. Those are two different arguments, and I. I, I my problem was with the first one, and and I think uh, my very good friend, uh, the Honourable Amalua, gave me the impression like he would have wanted uh, an audit that goes to an examination of outcome. Uh, that's what I said I don't think would be useful. An audit that would go to investigate uh, whether there was system failure at any point and whether that system uh, can be improved so that it never misfires again, I, I think that that Nobody would quarrel with that. Uh, <clears throat> now, Honorable Omar, social economic rights, uh, Honorable Omar says, and where shall we fund uh, this? Uh, uh, where shall we fund social justice from? Uh, and I would concede the argument that we must fund it from taxes. There is no other way to, aff to, to, to affordable housing. There is no other way to health care. There is no other way to schooling. There is no other way to a decent environment. We are just about to have an El Nino that will put hundreds of thousands of Kenyans 
uh, living by the riverside of, of our country in grave and mortal danger. And the only way we can provide, we can protect that, is again to spend more. And we have to spend more on protecting that. And unfortunately, I have a feeling we would have to either borrow or tax. And that is the reality of it. Uh, Honorable Amalwa wanted to know whether there is a, uh, Article 138 of the Constitution, whether there is a, a distinction between the chair and the commission. I believe there was, there is. Uh, whether the decision declared by the Electoral Commission is that of the chair or, or of that of the commission, it must be that of the commission. And the Supreme Court did find in this particular case that that was the decision of the commission because all the commissioners, including those who allegedly denounced the election, had participated in the tallying of the vote. And uh, the, the, the distinction between Participating in that and participating in the announcement was dealt with, in my very humble view, quite sufficiently by the Supreme Court. Um, equitable taxation. Um, yeah, I th again, I agree with that. I agree that uh, taxation must, uh, must create equity. Uh, uh, but I also believe that uh, in, a social, in, a, in, a, in a democracy such as ours, those who have the resources, like members of parliament, must be taxed more so that we can be able to provide, <laughs> to provide for, for the community and the society. And those like university professors who don't earn a lot should be taxed less. About, because they do not have the resources. Uh, and school teachers who earn even less should be taxed less. So I agree that there ought to be equity uh, in, in taxation. Um, um, information, Prof. Not just equity. I refer you to the provisions of uh, Article 201B1. Yeah. And I read, the burden of taxation shall be shared Fairly. Fairly. Not even equitably. Yes. Fairly. I, yes, yes. I thank you for that guidance. And uh, I think that it makes, it makes my point better. Uh, there is one controversial position I have held about tax. Uh, and I think I've already been controversial enough for one morning. But uh, I have always felt that... Uh, we are getting into a time and an age in this country where some of the estates of deceased citizens are so large, they are so large that they ought to be taxed. I know it's a very unpopular view, but uh, when you read of billions of shillings in, uh, in estates, like, and we could put a limit. We could say we start with 20 billion. We would still be, those that would still be many estates and, and there is a way of raising funding that way. I know it is not popular and I will say no more about it. Uh, my learned friend and honorable Omogeni, I don't think I would consider the Mozambique model uh, a successful model. Every time you allow, every time you allow a person to be the appointing authority in respect of a commission that would determine his own uh, faith as a politician, I think you create a temptation. And I want to remind my friend, uh, the Honorable Mogheni, in the beginning at independence, you know, we didn't even have, uh, there was no electoral commission. You remember there was a man called Montgomery, 
Montgomery was an officer in the AG's office. He was answerable to Charles Jonjo. So Charles Jonjo conducted the elections through Montgomery. Then when Montgomery left, a gentleman, uh, I think from the Highlands, called uh, Nyar Nyarango. Yeah, Nyarango. Is that Nyarango? He became the, the, co the commissioner of elections, and life went on. The, the clamor to create a commission came because the capriciousness of that process under one person answering to the attorney general became apparent. So the commission was institutionalized to deal with that. So I would not like politicians to have a direct say on who becomes the umpire, the referee of the competition in which they are participating. Now, then you ask me, and I don't have the right answer. So what do you want us to do? Uh, ask Pricewaterhouse to do it? or a consulting firm to do it. I'm not sure that that is also correct. Uh, I th think the way we are doing it, the model we have con conceptually is the correct model. To build into it safety, safety valves is the challenge, and I don't have the answer. Uh, <clears throat> I think I seem to have no, no, no. Oh, this would be terrible if I didn't deal with the ladies, Honorable Wabilianga's comments. Uh, it, uh, let me assure you, I have saved the best for last. Uh, and uh, if we increase the number of constituencies, now, and we go back to our, our corner drum, if we, incre we have, if we increased parliament to 500 members, we will double expenditure and we, need, we will need to tax more. And our basic problem then will be multiplied. I think what we should do is to reduce, uh, is to reduce the number of seats and then guarantee women 50% of those seats. Um, that is less problematic. And I don't want to say anything about parliament. Uh, sorry, sorry, about the Senate. Uh, I think the Senate is of a reasonable size. Uh, but uh, I'm, I think the Senate is of a reasonable size. And this, uh, this problem, uh, uh, if we call it the, the problem of, uh, of, of the gender problem, you can see how problematic it can be when you look at the counties. Because then down there, they, 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 the top up, the top up to, 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 to achieve uh, the top up to achieve uh, the, the required uh, proportions uh, can result in a really bloated assembly. Uh, so I would like to stop there, Mr. Chairman. As we, as we, we, we have to thank you for those uh, observations. And you know, Prof, I came in uh, the tail end of your presentation. So I now must moderate my moderate my compliments, <laughs> uh, if you allow me. Yes. Yeah, because I may not necessarily agree with everything you've said, particularly on the issue of taxation. Um, that's why I referred you to Article 201 and, and fair, fair taxation. Today, our policemen are actually having a negative payslip. On the one hand, uh, something was added to them, and then the take-home, <laughs> take-away uh, package is minus. I don't even know when, if we are now taking them to Haiti, <laughs> what, what the whole thing would mean. Uh, and of course, on Haiti, I would uh, opine that these things should really first go to Parliament. That, I think, is how ideally it should be. That's not for our discussion. But uh, 
You know, you were on record, I hope you uh, pronounce yourself on that, Prof, that during the last elect presidential election, were you amicus or you actually on, on one side? Uh, that would have been very important because coming out uh, strongly as you do on the outcome, the pronounced outcome by the highest court in the land and, and the subsequent clamor for these things, um, including what uh, Omgen was saying, um, really, I think it's important. Now, Mozambique, as we all know, was basically a country where that went through serious, serious struggle. And even now it is actually under threat of, of uh, religious insurgency in the north. And you know the main players, uh, Frelimo and Renamo, um, the political reality at the time um, meant that uh, the leaders of those two political formations, a country coming out of, uh, out of uh, conflict, and this country actually had to help Mozambique, uh, specifically in some of those areas. You may remember the role of uh, Bethel Kiplagat, the late Bethel Kiplagat played in trying to assist the people of Mozambique to opine is what you're calling a uh, mitigated disaster of IPPG is what actually delivered because when you have two when you have two strong appointing authorities and they're sitting at the level of a commission then <laughs> clearly the balance the balance of terror if you like with what will deliver results, and that's what happened in 2002. I don't think we need to, to belabor the point, but we hear you, uh, and I personally have uh, the highest of esteem for you, Prof, and continue uh, being close. If you can uh, add your reflections and give us something in writing, it will be very useful for us. Thank I'll try you. to do that, and thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. I think Amnesty International is the next group.